Hilary Mantel, many congratulations. Thank you. Why Thomas Cromwell and this whole period? Where did it come from? Thomas Cromwell came before, uh, came first. I wasn't wishing to write a novel about the Tudor era. I think you find your person first. And whatever you think of him, his story is fascinating. Whether you take him as hero or villain, he was the son of a blacksmith in Putney. He ended up as an earl and the king's right-hand man for a decade, one of the most tumultuous decades in English history. So that trajectory, you've got to ask yourself, how did he do it? Are you on a mission to redefine him in the public mind? Redefine him, yes. Glorify him or rehabilitate him, no. Um, you know, some people have said my reading of Cromwell is too sympathetic. But I could have chosen very different ways of telling the story uh, that would have exonerated him from most of the things he's blamed for. And there would have been respectable evidence to back that up. But um, what I've done is go for maximum ambiguity. I haven't made up my mind about Cromwell. And I think I want to put the reader in that position. So the questions are open to the last page of the last book. Are you, are you a little obsessed with him? I don't really like the word. I think obsession is dangerous for a writer. Uh, you have to keep the right side of that line. You have to be persevering and persistent but not to lose your focus. There must be an ironic distance between yourself and your character. After all, you know the end of the story and they don't. Peter Stoddart, the chairman of the judges, has said that, that uh, Bring Up the Bodies is better than Wolf Hall. How do you feel about that? It's a very different book and it made different demands. Wolf Hall is a huge, capacious novel which it's very ambitious, it has a lot to do, many years to encompass, many layers of storytelling, and a whole world to build for the reader. So it cannot be formally perfect in the way that a more concentrated narrative can be. With Bring Up the Bodies, we're covering nine months, and we're concentrating on a period of only three weeks. And so, there's an arrow that flies to the target. You know what you have to do. The story gathers pace, momentum, and terrific energy propels it through. And what you're hoping to do is get the reader turning the pages faster and faster. And then coming to the end of it and thinking, yes, but I'm not quite sure how it happened. I'll have to read it again. Maybe it'll look different. That's the ideal. And I think with that kind of condensed narrative, you can achieve a technical polish which eludes you in a bigger project. Are you trying to tell the truth? I'm trying to make the reader aware that there are versions behind versions behind versions and that we may have to select, as Thomas Cromwell says in the book, a truth we can use. Or we'll never have the whole truth and nothing but the truth uh, in history as in contemporary life. But what we must do is, Judges and Prejudice, approach the evidence with an open heart and a questioning spirit. So are you a historian, really? No, I'm not. What I do doesn't add to history. It's, no, it's neither greater nor lesser than the discipline of history. It's something else. It's something beside history. Uh, it tells us about what it felt like to be there as best I can reconstruct it. The historian tells us what happens. The novelist tells us how it felt while it was happening. The historian operates with hindsight. The, the novelist moves forward with the characters. 
And the novelist explores, it, the novelist goes beyond the limits of documentary evidence into the murky waters of motivation, those motivations that may not be present even to the character's own minds, goes into the hinterland, into the subconscious, and it considers the part of randomness and accident in life. Historians have to make a narrative that to a degree is tidy and seems to obey the laws of cause and effect. The novelist, if you like, can open up the past and say, it was like this, but it need not have been. These were the turning points. These were the points when it might have gone differently. Um, why do you why do you think you've ended up being so good at writing novels about history rather than just something plucked from your mind? I th think it is my strength. Um, and it's what I, I prefer. I've come to that conclusion. I've written more contemporary novels than historical novels. I can't really explain it from... My earliest childhood, I have had a real feeling for the past and a reverence for the past. And I'd like to think an ability to translate myself to another place. I don't mean to be mystical about it, but the past to me has always been very present. Also, you know, I love the research aspect. I love handling these industrial quantities of facts and I love having the freedom to make leaps and connections so it, pl it plays to my strength really. Can I ask a little bit about you? I mean you've, you've sure. spoken in the past about your illness and, yes. and, and the role it plays in you having become a writer. Yes. Do you think it's the reason you became a writer? I suppose I knew as a child that I could write, but I didn't have the ambition to be a novelist or a full-time writer. I suppose I thought you did a job and you might write. For instance, you might be become a historian, but a writing historian. Um, the fact that I became so single-minded about it in my early 20s was just a reflection of my ill health, as you say. And the fact that I had to have a trade, a skill, that was controllable by me, on my own time, my own hours. Of course, I had jobs as well. Um, so it meant that, you know, writing was a weekend and evening pursuit. But it was the long game, because I hoped that one day my, my writing would, would support me. And I, I would be able to do it full time. Of course, what I hadn't really reckoned on is how little money is to be made by fiction alone. And for most of my writing career, I've been a journalist as well. Um, you, you became patron of the of an endometriosis charity. That's right. Um, how how do you think? The, the way women are treated by the medical profession when it comes to endometriosis has changed since the way you were treated. Because you seem to have been treated in a rather brutal way. From what yes, I think brutal and negligent would be the words that sum it up. I would like to say things have vastly improved and I, I, I think the attitude of the profession has improved. I think care is more patient-centred and doctors do try to listen, although they don't always succeed, and there are constraints of time and so on. Unfortunately, the average time from, diagno from the woman's first complaint to diagnosis with this particular condition, you're still looking at about seven to nine years. And in that time, a lot of damage can be done to the body. And that hasn't come down significantly since I was making my way through the system in the 70s. There's still a lot to be done and there is a battle to inform doctors and health professionals 
So that if a woman presents with a puzzling set of symptoms, you don't just say, must be psychosomatic, dear. Uh, you ask yourself, could this be endometriosis? Uh, th there's a huge problem for doctors in that a bewildering variety of symptoms can present. It's not the easiest thing to diagnose. But, as it's always said, you listen to the patient and they'll tell you what's wrong. How much of this has ended up being reflected in your work and your, in, in your writing? I mean, the way, I, I mean, both the way you've been treated and, and perhaps dismissed at, at times as a patient, mm. but also the, the pain and the, the difficulties that you went through as well. Well, that's interesting because writing about the illness itself I have confined to my memoir. But you know, the thing about being a novelist is you can draw material from all sorts of sources. And in a way, the worse things get, the better they get. Uh, happiness doesn't provide you with good material, and comfort doesn't prove much of an inspiration for fiction. As I move into the third book of the Cromwell trilogy, I'm looking at Henry, and people constantly ask, what went wrong with Henry? Did he have some rare disease? Was it that knock on the head he got in, uh, in 1535? Did his personality undergo a huge change? And of course, what I know is, that we do know Henry was in chronic pain. I know that what, do, what that does to degrade the personality, to detract from rationality. I think I can write about this well. I don't think it's quite as mysterious as people would believe if you understand what long-term pain does, both to the body and the mind. So, yes, I'll get a little something out of my experience, though it might seem very remote from Henry's. You've also written about gender and the way, and the way you are defined. You know, people are talking about you now as the first woman to win the Booker, oh, yeah. Man Booker twice. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, you, you said before that when you're read, you are gendered. That that's, but you're not when gendered you when write, you write. Yes, I think when you write, you're not gendered. But when you read, people are really thrown by authors who use initials only until they find out which sex they are. Uh, it, it's it's ever present for me. I've lived in Saudi Arabia. It's the front line of the sex war. Uh, the issues immediately become plain. Bringing the story home, I think that I certainly would have been read differently earlier in my career if there had been a man's name on the cover, because I think that I have always been an intensely political novelist. That doesn't mean I've written about the day-to-day -day parliamentary or party political process. It means politics in a wider sense. Um, but what was taken from my books was the domestic. I even wrote, I wrote an enormous novel about the French Revolution a one critic managed to say there were too many references to wallpaper. Actually, what happens in the book is a newly married wife says to her husband, what should we have? For, shall we have triage? And he says, ask me a real question. Of course, I'm on his side. But it's, uh, it was a stick to beat me with, you know? So is your gender relevant? Yeah, it's got to be relevant when you're read, and, and it will continue to be so. People have a, a huge interest in the personal lives of authors. God knows why, because they're as dull as ditch water most of the time. Well, you're so amazing. It's fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, person sits in the room and stares at screen. That's the reality of it. Um, but people construct it in their mind as a glamorous life. And of course, um, what the author wears, uh, what body that mind is in, uh, the, 
the fripperies of personality, if you like, they can become of consuming interest. And when you're writing, all that drops away. You forget who you are and what age you are and what sex you are. Uh, and if you don't forget, I don't think you're doing it right. <laughs> How will you feel if number three doesn't win a man brooker? Do you know, uh, I can hardly expect that. It would be plain greedy, wouldn't it? And what I think is, I know what I have to do with the book. To go away and do it. And that aspect of it, I'll worry about it uh, that distant day when we come to publication. I am absorbed and enthralled in the project itself and in what I'm going to do over the next year. So I'll postpone thinking about the rest. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.